Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Lakeville United Methodist Church. I'm so glad to see you all here with us today. Before we begin, we do have a few announcements to bring before the congregation. First announcement, tomorrow at 7 p.m. is our staff parish meeting. So if you're a part of the SPRC, please come up to the church on Monday at 7 o'clock so we can do the business of the church. On Tuesday at 7 p.m., Mary Magdalene Mission Circles have their meeting here. And Thursday at 7 p.m., we have our fellowship meeting. Next Saturday is going to be a lot of fun. You all enjoyed the first ice cream social so much, we're doing it again. So come here Saturday, September 24th from 2 to 4 p.m. and enjoy a lot of ice cream. You haven't had ice cream yet? Well, if you show up Saturday, I'll get you all the ice cream you want, okay? Okay. If you know anyone who wants ice cream or hasn't gotten ice cream yet, well, tell them to, okay? All right. This Also this Saturday at 7 p.m. is our Euchre game night. Come early. Play some really fun games and have a lot of good competition. And maybe this time Larry will remember what's Trump. Where is Larry? There you are. You're back there today. <laughs> and next Saturday, we're having our service at 9 a.m., but we're also going to have a fellowship meal following it. Brunch. Who doesn't love brunch, right? So... Bring a brunch item. It could be a breakfast casserole. It could be a hash brown casserole. It could be a biscuits and gravy casserole. You're getting what I'm going with, right? Bring a casserole. We're going to have a great meal, chances to sit and talk and be a church family for a meal. So next Sunday, 9 a.m. is worship service, so nothing's changed then. And following that, we'll have our brunch. So bring a casserole. Monday, September 26th at 9.30 a.m. across the street is Catherine Butts' memorial visitation. And then at 11.30 a.m. is the memorial service. That's all the announcements I have today, but does anybody else have announcements to bring before the congregation? Yeah, Carol. I just want to especially thank everybody that helped with the uh, rummage sale this weekend. It was kind of really quickly planned. We bumped it up a couple weeks, so, but you had great donations. I was a little concerned about that. We didn't give you enough time to do that, but we had plenty of stuff here. <laughs> I almost called it junk, but it was lovely <laughs> junk. <laughs> but, um, we actually already have cleared over $1,500, which I'm always excited about when we clear $1,500. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and when I pay my bill, I think it's going to be over $1,600. <laughs> so um, I found a lot of nice junk <laughs> so, that I really needed to have. So anyway, I, I appreciate the men and women. The, we always have a few men that show up to help, and Gary always brings his truck and hauls it all away for us. So. I am especially grateful for all of your help because it can't get done without our whole group. So thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements? <laughs> then I invite you to rise your able in body and spirit for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, Lord, we come to you this day in an attitude of prayer, giving thanks, singing in joy for all that you've done for us, Lord. Lord, we pray that our words are a joyful noise that give praise to your holy name. And Lord, we pray that you open our hearts and our minds so that we can receive your word that we can receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that unites us here in worship today and the Spirit that leads us forth from here, energized 
and ready to serve your kingdom. Lord, this day, we also pray for a blessing to be upon these blankets. The blankets that the sewing circle has so diligently worked on. Not for themselves, but for your children, Lord. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit be upon these blankets, that your grace fill these blankets with comfort, with healing, with safety. Lord, we pray. We pray for those who receive this blanket, whether it's while in the hospital, home unable to leave after a bad doctor's appointment. We pray for your children. We pray for your healing touch be upon them. And we pray that these blankets serve as a source of comfort, source of warmth, and a reminder that no matter where they may go, that they are loved. That they are loved by you, Lord, and that they are loved by us. And that they are a part of our church family. That they'll always be in our prayers, in our hearts, and in our minds. So, Lord, we pray these blankets go and find your children that need them. And, Lord, in your name we pray, now and always. Amen. Now, as you remain standing for our opening hymn, number 467, Trust and Obey. <laughs>
Please remain standing and join me in the call to worship. O oh God, we come into your courts with praise and thanksgiving. We come in celebration and song. We come in gratitude of your inheritance. We come as those who have received blessing upon blessing. We hear the cry of the poor in the land and ache to offer them relief. We come to bring them blessing upon blessing in Jesus' name. O oh God, we come into your courts with praise and thanksgiving. We come in celebration and song. You may be seated. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward, collect our tithes and our offerings.
Lord God, we come to you this day in joy and thanksgiving for all that you've done for us. For we recognize all that we have is a gift from you. And in gratitude, we return thee as our tithes and our first fruits, our offerings. And we lay them upon your altar. Lord, we pray for a blessing be upon them that they may help us do the missions and ministries you've entrusted to our care. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, as we enter into this time of meditation and prayer, I invite you to lift up before God and before the congregation any prayer requests you have this day or God sightings, joys, and celebrations so that we as a church family can celebrate the Lord together. And if you're joining us from home, we invite you to post on our Facebook wall or YouTube feed any prayer requests. We'll make sure they are prayed over this week. And if during the week you have a prayer request, contact myself or the office and we'll put you on our prayer board. Thank you. <laughs> Prayers for Carol McDougal as she goes to surgery this week. Prayers of Thanksgiving that Tom is home finally. It's good to have you with us today, Tom. And prayers for healing as he continues to recover. And prayers that he gets out of AFib. I have a prayer of thanksgiving for our church family. And to see every Sunday that we're growing a little bit more too. So when we need to all pull together, we do. <laughs> it makes a difference. Yes. Prayers of thanksgiving for our church family. That we're able to pull together to do the missions that God has given us. To help each other out. And prayers that every Sunday it seems like we're growing a little more. And that's amazing. Prayers for Karen Lynn. For prayers for Karen Lind. Lind. Prayers for Karen Lind for health. <laughs> prayers of joy that the preschool first week it happened yeah <laughs> but continue prayers for the teachers and the students as many more weeks to come <laughs> prayers for Nancy Shirley Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we come to you this day with the prayers upon our hearts. We leave our stressful lives, our worries and concerns at your feet. Lord, we pray that we can focus, focus on the one thing needful on you, Lord. We pray that we can hear your voice. We can see where you're calling us. Lord, we pray the prayers that are on our hearts to this day, both spoken and unspoken. We pray for our church, for our church family, those who are able to be here today and those who are joining us whether digitally or in spirit. We pray, Lord, for our church family. We pray for healing be upon our brothers and sisters who need it, Lord. We pray that we can be in connection with our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be. 
whether they're going down to the south for the warmer weather, whether they're home healing from surgery or injury. Lord, wherever they may be, they are part of our church family. Your spirit unites us. Your love unites us. And we're called to care for one another. Lord, we pray. We pray that we can continue to serve you faithfully. That we can perform the missions and ministries you've entrusted to our care. To share your love with our community. And we pray that you open our eyes, open our ears, so we can see new ways that our church family can be out in the world sharing your love. Lord, we do pray for our community this day. Lord, we pray for our preschool. We pray for the teachers and students. We pray for elementary, middle, and high schools. Lord, we pray for our neighbors whom you've called us to love as we love ourselves. Lord, we know there are hurts, there are concerns, there are worries that we do not see. But you see, Lord. You see because you know all. You love all. And we pray, Lord, that you guide us and that, <clears throat> that you guide us so that we can continue to serve you, that we can find new ways to share your love. And Lord, we pray for our nation, our world, and all of its leaders. We pray for your wisdom be upon our leaders this day. And we pray for your peace, your love, your mercy, your justice to flow over the earth. And we pray for your children, God, your children across the globe. Those who are facing disasters and wars and rumors of wars. Who are stressed, who are lost, who are worried and anxious. Lord, we pray for them all. And Lord, we do give you thanks this day for all that we have. For all that we have is a gift from you, Lord. We give you thanks for this beautiful morning. We give you thanks for the roof over our heads. We give you thanks for a chance to be here together. Most of all, God, we give you thanks for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to be with us, who died for us, was raised for us. It's in his name we pray now, the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he is not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs>
right. I invite the kids to come forward for a message. You want to come up? No? Hi, I don't know if I've met you. I'm Pastor Ed. What's your name? Monroe? Okay. Hey, Monroe. Hey, you want to give me... Okay, I'm just going to kneel over here then, okay? How you guys doing? Have a seat. That dress is really sparkly. Yeah. How you guys doing? Good. Yeah. How was the first week of preschool for you? Fun? No? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fair. How was preschool? Is that a quiver? No, what is that? That's a cup holder? Where's that from? It's a quiver. It's whatever you want it to be. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about a time when Jesus told a parable. That's a little confusing, but I want to ask you guys a question. Okay, imagine if you will, it's Wednesday night, okay? Imagine it's Wednesday night, and it's really nice outside. It's really beautiful, and all you want to do is go outside and play, right? You can imagine that, going outside, running around with your pet or with your siblings or friends and just playing around, right? Or like swaying to slide. Yeah. But imagine if before you left school that day, your teacher told you you had a lot of homework and that you should do it all that night or else you could get in trouble. That would be pretty bad, right? Because you want to play outside, but you have to do your homework. And then let's say one of your parents said, hey, by the way, you need to clean your room all evening or else you're going to get in trouble. Okay, so you have to do three things, right? You have to play outside, you have to do all your homework, and you have to clean your room. And then someone else comes in and says, hey, you're supposed to go outside and weed in the garden. Have you ever weeded in the garden before? No, it's not fun. You get dirt everywhere. It's really not fun. You like getting dirt? Maybe it's good for you then. You can weed my garden, okay? Yeah. Okay. No. No? Okay. But let's see, you're told to do these four things. And you can't do them all at the same time, right? You can't play outside at the same time you're doing your homework. And you can't do your homework at the same time you're cleaning your room. And you can't clean your room if you're supposed to be outside doing yard work, can you? No. How do you feel if you're told to do all four of those things at the same time? Like I might get in trouble for all of them. Like you might get in trouble for all of them, right? Yeah, that's not fair, is it? And maybe you'll even get a little angry that somebody's telling you to do all these four things and you can't do them all? Okay. So, what would you do then? Would you maybe like, oh, I'm going to listen to my mom instead of my teacher? No? Yeah. Maybe like, I'm going to listen to my teacher instead of my mom, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's fair. You may do them all one at a time. What if you don't have time? Stay You'll stay up all night? Okay. I don't yeah. Jesus says, Jesus taught us that there's a lot of people out there telling us what to do. And a lot of times they're contradictory. You can't do them at the same time. And he says, you can't, you can't serve two people. Because if you do, maybe you'll get angry at one of them. You'll be like, why do they keep telling me to clean my room? I'm supposed to be doing my homework, right? Or maybe you just won't do one. You'll be like, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to do my homework tonight, and I'm just going to clean my room and do the yard work. Or maybe you just are like me, and you panic, and you don't do any of it, right? And Jesus says, that's the problem if you're trying to serve too many people. And Jesus says, here's the thing. In your life, you have a choice. You can serve God, 
Or you can serve what he called mammon, which is just a fancy word for, well, your own desires, you know, the things you want to do, the world, all that kind of stuff. And he says, a lot of times, what God asks you to do may not be what you want to do. Because God will ask you to be nice to people, right? And sometimes you don't want to be nice to those people, right? Maybe that person's mean to you. The siblings are giving each other a side eye. Have you guys ever been mean to each other? Yeah. Yeah. You're supposed to be nice to each other though, right? Yeah. So, what God, Jesus says is you need to choose to listen to God because God loves you completely, right? God loves you always, right? And God wants what's best for you, right? So, he asks you to listen to God and serve God. Pretty easy, right? What? No, it's not, is it? If you're ever confused about what God's asking you to do, you know who you can talk to? Okay, here's who you can talk to. You can talk to me. I'm a pastor. I know some things, right? Um, or sisters. Okay. You can also talk to your parents, right? They know some things. You can also talk to everyone here because they know some things, right? And if you're ever confused and you want some really good advice, you can go to God in prayer, right? Because God answers prayers, right? Okay. So, this week I have homework for you. Because who started classes yet? Preschool. You've, you've just complained about it. I know you're starting. <laughs> so, here's your homework. Homework is pretty simple. I like you to listen to your teachers, be super nice to everyone, and if that's hard... I'd like you to take a moment and pray to God for help. Okay? So if you're having trouble listening to your teachers, pray to God for some help. And if you're having problems with a classmate, pray to God for help. Can you do that? That's pretty easy homework, right? So next week, I'll ask you how you did. And I'll ask your parents how you did too. That way we're all honest. What about you do it right now? Okay, let's do it right now. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, be with us this, this week so that when we can hear what our teachers are saying, that we can do what we were asked of and that we can be nice. Nice to our friends, nice to our classmates, nice to the people that aren't nice to us. In your name we pray, now and always. Amen. All right. Follow Miss Rita. She's got some crafts for you to do today, okay? Let's see if I can stand up. Oh. Oh. Thank you.
Would you please stand while I read the uh, scripture this morning? It's taken from Luke 16, 1 through 13. <clears throat> then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that, thy, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He quickly, he quickly, and make it, sorry, he answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and, act, act, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may, be, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If, then, you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you their true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Excuse me. Let me let you in on a little secret about pastors. We often use the phrase in describing a scripture reading as difficult. This is a difficult reading for us today. This is a tough reading. What we usually mean by this is, I read this scripture and I'm in it and I don't like it. I feel called out by it, or I'm gonna be stepping on some toes if I preach on it today. That's usually what we mean when we say this is a tough scripture. But let, me rest, but let me assure you, when I say that today, this is a tough scripture reading, that this parable is one of Jesus' toughest parables out there, I don't mean that. What I mean is, you read this parable, this parable of the dishonest manager or the shrewd manager, depending on your translation, and you're stuck wondering, what did Jesus mean by this? What's this all about? Augustine, Luther, Wesley all complained about this parable. And in fact, if you go to Bible commentary today and you read up on it, basically what it summarizes is to, I don't know, good luck. So with that in mind, what I'm asking you is, I'm going to preach on it today. And if you come away thinking, no, I think it actually means this. Or no, God is telling me this then I ask you, stop by my office Monday to Thursday in the morning. Stop by, say hi, correct me, argue with me, agree with me, whatever. Because friends, I do believe it's in the tough scriptures where we have to wrestle, where we have to talk, that we grow. Because you're not grow, you don't grow if you're not challenged. And like I said, this is a challenging scripture. On its surface, it's pretty easy to understand. There once was a manager who stole from the boss. Well, he was actually accused of stealing. There's no evidence, but there's accusations. The boss hears that his manager is stealing, and what does the boss do? He fires him on the spot and demands to see the spreadsheets. He wants to see all the evidence. And the manager is in a panic. We have to remember, it's not just the manager's job that's at stake here. 
He's not just thinking, oh no, I'm gonna have to go job hunting somewhere else. I'm gonna have to spruce up my resume and all of that. No, his livelihood is on the line. He's going to lose his home because he lives in the boss's house. Without his manager position, he has no home, he has nothing. He is desperate, and the only people he can turn to is the people who hate him most. The people he can turn to and say, hey, do you mind if I sleep on your couch for a few days, are the people who despise him more than anyone else in this world. The people that owe his boss money. Because his job is to go around to the farmers and the shepherds and the workers and demand payment of what they owe. These people are basically forced into slavery thanks to the greed of the boss. And the manager who goes up and says, hey, where's this month's payment, is a reminder of that. For they have to pay this rent, and when they can't meet this rent, then they also are out on their ears. So to butter up all these people, these people that don't like him, he does exactly what he's accused of doing. He's accused of squandering the boss's wealth and the property. And what does he do? He does just that. He gives everyone a steep discount. He says, oh, your mortgage is $50,000. Well, now it's $25,000. Your car loan is $10,000. Make that $7,000. He actually probably helped these people a great deal. He got them into a place where they could actually get out of debt. Not out of the goodness of his heart, though. He didn't give these people a steep discount because he was soft-hearted. He did it out of self-interest. And then the boss comes back to the story at the end and applauds him for his cunning and says, oh, you're really shrewd there. Good job. The end. So we have a thief and a liar who steals from his boss and at the end is commended for it. What does that mean? At the end of it, you would expect Jesus to say something along the lines of, don't be like that guy. Don't be a thief. Don't be a liar. Never put yourself first. Don't do things out of your own self-interest. That's the lesson we expect from Jesus because that's the lesson that Jesus has given us so many other times. Practically every parable comes down to think of God first. Think of your neighbor second. Don't do things out of your own self-interest. Don't lie. Don't steal from the needy. Don't be a jerk. But then Jesus instead says, be like the manager. confusing. It's challenging. Christ actually seems to be endorsing this man, this thief and this liar. That can't be right, is it? It can't be that Jesus is saying, do the things he did, because we're not supposed to do the things he did. So that's why I think what Jesus is actually doing is saying not to do what the man does, But look at his example. Look at the wit he showed, the good he does. And that a reminder that in the end, you can only serve one master. If you look at the good, if you look at what the manager did and take away the motives, take away the self-interests, what the manager did was actually some really great good. He's helping people out of a tough situation. These are people that are drowning in debts that they can never pay off. Because if they could, then their master wouldn't have workers, and you can't have that, so the master would always find ways to add to their debt. They're basically slaves in all but names. And while we're not in that place, you probably know the feeling. You probably know the feeling of debt looming over your head. 
the dread that comes with knowing that your student loan, your car loan, your mortgage, your medical debt, your credit card bill, your back taxes, what have you, is coming due, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. There's a reason why study after study shows that the number one reason we are stressed out and anxious in life is finances. Debt is terrifying. It controls your life because you're working to pay it off and there's that fear of what happens if suddenly you can't. What if you can't pay it? Now just imagine all if someone comes along and you get a call from your bank, the bill collector, the collections agency, and they tell you without prompting that your debt has been sliced in half. No questions asked, you didn't do anything to deserve it, you didn't fill out a form or all that. No, your debt is suddenly reasonable. Instead of taking 60 years to pay off, suddenly only going to take 20. I'm pretty confident, say, everyone would take that offer after you check and make sure it's not a scam. You wouldn't care about why they were offering it. You wouldn't question their motivations of what's it good for the business if they're cutting my debt in half. You would just take it because you know it's helping you. And Jesus points to the dishonest man, the man who cared only about himself. The one whose real master was his own wants and needs. And says, if this liar, this thief, this greedy and selfish man can help so many people, can save so many lives, if this sinner can make their lives better, then what are you doing? If someone so crooked can do so much good, then what are we doing as well? Why can't we, people of faith, do so much more? For friends, we are called to do so much more. We're called to be out there in the world as a show of God's love. We're called to be there for the least and the last and the lost. The ones that society ignores. The ones that society tries so hard to forget exist. Because they're God's children just as we are. Friends, when we were baptized, when we were confirmed, when we were, became members of of the church, we make promises. We make promises before the church and before God that we will stand up against the forces of evil in this world. That's a call to action. And the best way to fight evil is to do good. Clothing those that are cold, feeding those that are hungry, visiting the sick and the prisoner all the calls that Jesus teaches us to do. For Jesus looks at this dishonest man, this selfish thief, and says, look at all the good that he did. Look at all the good he did out of selfishness. He helped those people even if he did it for the wrong reasons. And if someone so sinful can do that, then imagine what you, imagine what you, someone who professes the strength and power of God, someone who is part of the kingdom of heaven, can do. There's a lot of evil out there, my friends. There's a lot of hate and anger and justice and pain. There's a lot of suffering in our world. And we as Christians are called to fight that, to do more. Fight it by spreading love instead of hate. Reminding them that they are children of God, that they're loved by God even if they don't know it yet. We're called to be out in the world and not be of the world. Out there in our communities, helping grow the kingdom of God. A kingdom founded on mercy and love, justice and peace. But when we do nothing, when we do less than a selfish thief, when we rather close our eyes and our ears, friends, we do less than a liar, less than a manager who's stealing from his boss. When we don't fight evil as we promised to do in our baptism and confirmation, 
then what we do is we let evil reign. And if we're willing, willing to let that happen, then we have to ask ourselves the same question. Who is our master? Who do we serve? The dishonest ma manager had a master, a lord, and it wasn't his boss. No, he embezzled from his boss. No, his real master was himself. His own wants, his own desires, his secure, desire for security, his caring for his own wealth. Jesus ends this parable with a simple message. You can't serve two masters. We can't have two bosses. Because if we do, sooner or later, we stop listening to one and begin to hate them. Because all they are is another voice, annoyance to you that as you continue to give you orders, you won't obey. Our choice of bosses is simple. We can choose God or we can choose mammon. That is wealth, the seeking of wealth. Wealth, not just money, which is part of it, but at the heart of it all, wealth that boils down to your own desires, your own wants. People seek wealth for their own power, their own comfort, their own security, because no matter what the reason people seek wealth for themselves, Christ asks us the important question, the one that's the heart. Christ asks us an important question, one that's at the heart of discipleship. Who do you serve? Are we like the dishonest manager and serve wealth? Do we only care about ourselves and want our own wants and desires? The world serves wealth. That's true. People are judged by how much of it they accumulate, lauded for it more than anything else. But friends, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For when we seek wealth, we only care about ourselves. That means everyone else is inconsequential. A stepping stone or an obstacle to overcome, to get what you want. When we seek to serve ourselves first, pretty soon all we care about is ourselves. No one else matters. We get so wrapped up in our own desires that we can only look inward and become blind to the people around us. The very neighbors we're called to love as we love ourselves. The worst part of it all, friends, is that master is temporary. Because all of it is only here for a little, a little while. Riches are spent. Power fades. Our health fails. As Christ puts it, rust and moth take everything here. Mammon is a master that only lasts for a little while. But we are called to serve the one who exists forever and ever. The one who was there at the beginning, even beyond. And the one who will be there at the end and beyond. The one who set up everything because of love. We are called to serve the one that loves us completely, forgives us of our faults, and invites us to be more. We're called to serve the one that gives us everything, was willing to come to be with us, die for us, and be raised for us so that we would no longer know the power that sin and death had over us. Our Lord is the one that never fails, never falters, and is forever for all things fade, God never does. And when we serve him, we will be rewarded unlike any other boss can give. For our reward won't be temporary. It won't be for a moment and then gone. It won't be a shiny watch that turns your wrist green. No, our reward will be eternal. Serving wealth only leads to hurt. But serving God lifts the burden from us. Helps us be the people we're meant to be. Friends, Christ calls you. Calls you as his own. Calls you to trust and obey. For there's no other way. Trust in him, listen to him. And if we do that, then friends, we will do and see amazing things. 
We will move mountains. We'll change the world. We'll save lives. We'll do so much more than a liar and thief ever could. We'll do so much good. All we have to do is stop being our own bosses, our own desires and wealths control us and give them to the Lord. Serve the one who saved us, who made us. Because friends, if we do that, then nothing will ever stop us. Amen. I invite you to rise your able and body and spirit for our closing hymn. Friends, I pray you go from here and have a restful Sabbath. Thank you all who made this worship possible today. Thank you, choir. It was beautiful music, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Friends, I pray you have a restful week. Until we see each other again, I invite you to receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. And I pray for you this, that God may give you peace. Amen.